Bon tardi. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our next um, digital conference of Innovation C, leading the new era of governance. Governance, the action or manner of governing. Governance is the way rules, norms, and actions are structured, sustained, regulated, and held accountable. The degree uh, or formality depends on the internal rules of a given organization and externally with its business partners. Can governance be innovated? It's something that's been there forever. Governance mostly happens behind closed doors by people who think they know what to do. Sometimes they do right, sometimes it can go less right. With the upcoming elections in mind, Innovation C thought it was best to give the topic governance the attention it deserves. Governance isn't about an opinion or a feeling, but should be based on facts and the law, regulations. There are codes for good, good governance and for corporate governance. How is that um, for government itself? There are many questions regarding this topic, and in the last decade, there has been a huge improvement on the transparency of the governance culture. With Menno George, we have an aspiring politician who has 16 years of experience under his belt, working within the commercial, private, and public sector. He will share his experience and vision during his presentation. Our future of public governance. Our second speaker, Audrich Bakhuis, will share his knowledge as the legal counsel of the mun municipality of Rotterdam. His PhD thesis, autonomy, supervision, and intervention on the Caribbean islands of the Dutch kingdom makes him an expert in our kingdom affairs. With excellent governance, with excellent governance in public affairs, Abrich's presentation is bringing us the knowledge that we need with, uh, with the changes in governance due to COVID and the new COHO. As always, Innovation C wants to bring you education and innovation in our mini digital conferences. Please be sure to take advantage of the lecturer's knowledge and feel free to ask questions and discuss them during the round table after the presentations. You can follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn to stay up to date with future developments. But for now, let's turn off the notifications on our phones and take a moment to tune in with our next speaker. Some tips for an even better experience. Turn off the notifications of your phone so you can focus on the speakers. Use a headset or earpiece to avoid getting distracted. Feel free to communicate in the chat section, but don't share uh, private information. You can share your LinkedIn or your Facebook if you, if you prefer. If you have a question that you uh, want to have answered by the speakers, ask in the question tab and we will do our best to address it in the round table. As always, be respectful. We don't have to agree on everything, but we're still here together. Well, um, in the background, you can see her, but she's there. Diana Cecilia, as always, my uh, my trusted assistant that will help me in case my connection will break down. You will see her pop up in the screen and take over uh, to be um, uh, to be your presenter. Um, but for now, I'm uh, just going to invite uh, our first speaker. Um, he's not just a legal counsel. Uh, he also used to be a Dutch Marine. Albrecht Bakhuis, please uh, come on stage. In the meanwhile, for everyone in the chat, a welcome, 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 Bontati. Aldrich, Bontati, welcome. And are, are, are you there? Is your um, voice working? Bontati, everyone. Thank you for this invitation. And um, <clears throat> yes, I think my mic is on, so uh, I can hear myself. So we're all set, now, I think. Yes. It's been a while since we had a speaker um, from Holland. Uh, right now in Holland, you have a, 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 a <coughs> night clock, a, a curfew. So uh, um, you are on time inside. How is it for you to have a curfew now? <laughs> well, um, it's actually well in these times. It's it's, it's not as it's not that bad. Um, uh, it's it's still get dark uh, early, at the early hour. So um, and, and only only this week we got a little bit of a. A better, uh, better weather. Uh, until last week, we had some. It was cold outside, so uh, there was nothing. There was or is actually nothing to do outside anyway, because um, everything is uh, still uh, closed and still in a pretty hard, uh, hard lockdown. 
uh, now with the curfew um, uh, at nine, it's uh, yeah, it's it's doable. So um, it's not as, as as bad as as the time I remember a, a year ago in Curacao, where we had uh, two days a week to go to uh, to go to, to, to go uh, go to groceries or to, uh, to, to go outside or sneak into someone's trunk, in, uh, like we used to do in, in Curacao. Uh, even if, I, as a matter of fact, that's a, a joke I use nowadays to, to my colleagues in the uh, municipality of Rotterdam. I tell them, you know, you uh, okay, cur curfew. It's it's of course it's, it's bad, but you know it's even worse. You have a prime minister that tells you you have to go buy panku keshi at the toko. <laughs> at the corner of the street. <laughs> so we still have the liberty to go everywhere, and it, uh, yeah, it. it, 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 it Different, of course, and uh, uh, but yeah, it's uh, not it's not as, as bad. And I have my I have my Dutch tulips uh, right here besides me, so that's uh, also bringing a little bit of uh, uh, light into the uh, early darkness. Okay, well, I'm very curious. Later in the round table, I would love to uh, also hear the the difference between lockdown in in, in Holland and and uh, and in Curaçao. But for now, I would say. Um, Please take the stage. Uh, uh, do tell us a little bit about who Albrecht is, uh, what you do, why you do it, and of course, uh, uh, share your presentation. I'll uh, see you at the end uh, of your presentation again. Yes. Toy, toy, toy. Okay, thank you. I am going to share the presentation, which was, uh, yes. Okay, it's live. Um, well, actually, I prepared a, a, a presentation um, a few days ago uh, by the request of both of Andrew, of course. Um, but this morning I woke up and uh, I thought, no, I'm going to do things a little bit different. Um, uh, as, um, of course, in the, into the, the preparation for this, uh, uh, this setting, um, uh, Andrew asked me to tell a little bit more about myself because the presentation I had prepared and uh, you will see, of course, is, uh, um, uh, it is more uh, of um, a lecture than it is a, a, a mini conference. So I'm going to try to uh, switch a little bit from a more personal side uh, as to um, uh, giving you also my, my, my perspectives um, and impressions, of course, uh, and a little bit of part of my, uh, the research I did for my P the PhD thesis I um, defended almost a year ago. Uh, fun fact, also for the round table uh, later on. Um, so I had my PhD defense on uh, this on March 6th uh, here in the Netherlands in Rotterdam. I was still living in Curacao, and that was actually the last uh, party I ever went to as of that year. So uh, a week later, all uh, PhD uh, dissertation defenses were cancelled. Uh, the universities closed and the entire uh, country went to, into a lockdown, as we know. So that was the last big party I had. Um, so I was, I was actually, I was, I was pretty lucky. Um, a little bit more about me. So yes, I moved from Curacao to uh, actually Amsterdam, where I live right now, uh, in, in July uh, last year. So during the pandemic. Um, I uh, came across uh, well, actually, the opportunity to 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 uh, to to, um, to work in Rotterdam, uh, which I uh, immediately grasped, and, and things went pretty quick from there. Uh, but so, as of July, uh, I, I moved to uh, the Netherlands, uh, living in Amsterdam, working in, in uh, for the city of Rotterdam. Um, I yes, uh, as I in, mentioned in the introduction. Um, I am the legal counsel to the uh, to actually the the city government. So you have the mayor and you have a few executive uh, uh, officials, um, what they call in Dutch uh, burgemeester and wethouders. Um, so they have a, um, a special department within the city of uh, city of Rotterdam because the city of Rotterdam actually has uh, over uh, seventeen thousand uh, employees. And um, of which uh, I think uh, almost a thousand lawyers, um, but they have a special department where, um, which I'm uh, actually lucky to be part of, uh, which uh, provides special legal advice on um, international affairs or uh, larger political or uh, societal affairs, which have may have political consequences for uh, the mayor or for uh, the executive officials. 
Uh, these are not elected officials. These, these are uh, uh, so burgemeesters and wethouders are not elected directly. They are part of a coalition, um, uh, and actually uh, are you can um, um, yeah. They, it's, it's almost similar to to a regular uh, uh, to the, the Curacao government as we know it. Actually, more like the the diputados which we used to have prior to uh, uh, the dismantling of the, the Dutch Antilles, or the Netherlands Antilles. Um, so Rotterdam is, a, uh, I have a picture here, uh, you, can, you can see on the left, the nice Erasmusbrug, um, the building it's called, which is called the Rotterdam, a uh, beautiful building uh, right next, on, uh, next to a hotel uh, New York. Um, a very historical place uh, on which the ships uh, or actually people embarked the, the, the ships to go to uh, to New York and on the, the Holland America uh, line, historical place, beautiful city, uh, which are, with a large um, uh, port, of course, one of the major ports uh, of the world uh, still, um, and also, uh, yeah, a large city with not compared to, of course, American city, not that, that large, we have around 800,000 uh, people, but with, with the large uh, uh, um, metropolitan issues that you can see in all, kind of, uh, kind of all kinds of cities. Um, and that brings me a little bit to my more uh, personal story on this. Um, I was working with uh, one of the major firms, uh, the law firms in Curaçao, or actually in the Dutch Caribbean, Van Epsken en van Doorne, for five years. Um, really enjoyed my time uh, there, learned a lot. We worked uh, a lot as counsel, legal counsel too. Uh, 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 to actually to the Curacao government, the Aruba government, uh, and the St. Martin government in, in, in various um, uh, ways. Um, but then I, uh, when I got the opportunity to go to Rotterdam, um, I thought I would grasp it, not because I was unhappy in Curacao, but more I wanted to see a little bit more from a, 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 a larger perspective, uh, but actually being um, in, the, in almost the same position, uh, but from a different perspective uh, and in a larger organization uh, to feel how it was so I can use this um, uh, experience in a later phase, which brings me actually um, to the next part of my uh, presentation, because otherwise I'm going to have a, uh, a, 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 a tool, my introduction is going to be too long and it's going to be all about myself, which um, actually will leave for the round table if people are still interested. Um, so the large Part of my, um, actually, my thesis was on, uh, as uh, it was mentioned in my introduction, uh, autonomy and supervision, uh, especially, um, and that's also the main theme of um, everything uh, I do nowadays. But also, I uh, try to advocate in my uh, in my daily daily work, um, and, uh, as a person, as a professional, or as a, an authority, uh, you have uh, a certain level of self determinants or self-governance, uh, but it all also brings responsibility. Uh, and that responsibility um, is al always um, uh, put into a, a, a system of checks and balances. And a part of that system of checks and balances is supervision, of course. Um, just a little bit to, to uh, go forward to the, um, uh, the matter of um, uh, the kingdom, and actually the. Um, let's see how we present the next slide. Yes. Um, yes, our kingdom is uh, because um, I'll also do an introduction for our, the next speaker uh, to to take to take along actually the coho. Uh, but before we get to that, um, just a little introduction on what our kingdom actually uh, is: the kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, not only we have great baseball players uh, playing together, coming from different countries, uh, but wearing one shirt. Um, we are under one crown. Uh, we have four countries, four different parliaments, uh, four prime ministers, which is pretty uh, uh, funny to have uh, with together with those four parliaments. Uh, four constitutions, which are pretty similar, but you, ha you still have differences. Uh, one Supreme Court, uh, uh, Hoge Raad. Um, in which cases are brought to uh, in in the Hague, which actually decides on the the, the interpretation of legal uh, concepts, uh, but using actually different uh, um, 
civil codes and this, uh, different uh, constitutions or legal actual legal um, uh, yeah, frameworks. Um, and one kingdom government, the Rex uh, Ministerat, in which it all comes together, which is the highest executive body we have in our um, in our system. So quickly, um, self-governance, um, autonomy, as they say in Dutch. Uh, what is it, and does it put any food on the table? Um, it's a, a very yeah um, broad and 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 actually ancient. Um, um, basic legal principle, self-governance. It's it means actually from a more uh, Caribbean or a Dutch Caribbean perspective, it means uh, being able to determine your own local rules um, by means of a democratically elected body. So you choose, you get to choose and vote the people who decide on the rules which you have to abide uh, by. Um, and also a very important uh, aspect also of self-governance is um, uh, financial self-governance. So the way you uh, have your, 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 your tax frame and the way you spend, you, you spend your, uh, actually the, your tax income as a country uh, or, uh, and the way you uh, use your budget is um, also par part of, of self-governance. Government, way back before uh when we when when actually the dutch islands uh, used to be uh, colonies of the dutch kingdom all entries from from uh from taxes uh would go to um to the hague uh to the colonizer and the colonizer would decide what would remain in those in those different territories or what uh, would come back and that's of course a, a concept um, well we don't know anymore but it's still as a as a legal principle as a, as a basic principle of governance uh, it's still very alive and and and, and we'll see you'll also uh, hear maybe a little bit about it from uh, uh, Menno um, being able to to determine um, where you use your uh, your uh, your revenues or or how you spend or how you you draft your budget and actually use it um that's a, a very important um, aspect of, uh, of of being able to 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 to, to participate and and also to be a self self-governing uh, territory territory or country um what i must say is that um it's always very or always in 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 a, um it's uh, it's not as as black and white as one would uh, one would think, uh, because the Netherlands, for example, is also um, very uh, uh, is restricted in its uh, financial self governance. Uh, it has to abide to the euro, to, to the EMU, in EMU uh, territory, and still has certain budget rules to abide to. Now, also actually um, um, joining and actually paying uh, for the big um, uh, part of um, uh, part of money that is being distributed back there in, in, in Brussels so um, it might seem uh, very uh, very nice uh, and, 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 and must have principle to have in your own democratic system to have self-governance but uh, you're all, uh, in most of the cases you'll see, um, that um, there is always someone who has a, who is bigger, or you're always part of a bigger, uh, a bigger picture. So, so from there on, um, uh, one uh, very important aspect, also from my from my thesis, and uh, what we're seeing nowadays, even yesterday, I read it in the uh, in the Purcell paper, is the kingdom being part of that kingdom uh, as a safety net. So. Um, being uh, at Curaçao, St. Martin, Aruba, being uh, um, autonomous countries within uh, the, the, the Dutch Kingdom, it brings a lot of um, freedom, of course, uh, being able to ha have all those aspects of self-governance, but also um, um, it brings responsibility, and um, uh, especially um, uh, it brings responsibilities, and also it, it provides into a, in a in a safety net. Uh, and that, that safety net is has different levels. Um, for example, uh, human rights um, uh, as part of being as being part of the Dutch country and the Dutch kingdom, uh, or not the country, the kingdom, 
actually. Um, uh, we're part uh, or uh, part to a lot of uh, human rights treaties, which gives us uh, it gives all citizens a special protection, um, the right uh, on 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 fair trial, for example, or uh, the right not to be um, detained uh, without any uh, le any legal co uh, cause. Um, also, the legal certainty, I already mentioned um, the involvement of the, uh, the Supreme Court, which is a very important aspect uh, for the Caribbean uh, territories, the countries, because um, what you see is actually, and this is a, a, a more uh, things that you can see in practice, um, you, you, what you see in Curacao and Aruba, especially, for, uh, for example, is uh, seeing companies registering um, uh, their airplanes um, in in Curacao or in Aruba or ships in a, as a country, and um, it pro because it provides a certain um, uh, uh, matter of comfort and safety, knowing that if there's any dispute on um, on, on 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 such a plane or on, on a ship, you can go to the Dutch uh, to the to the to the first to Curacao or Aruba court and actually to the, all the way to the Supreme Court, and you'll know that um, your uh, process is due, or that you have due process, let me say it correctly. Um, one of the, 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 in, on the third and, uh, from my perspective, most important uh, aspect of uh, being part of that the, the kingdom and having that safety net is uh, good governance, uh, which is an, it has two sides. The first side, the one side, it has its a responsibility. So Curacao, Aruba, St. Martin, but also the Netherlands are um, uh, obliged uh, to um, promote good governance, uh, which is a very important um, aspect to have when you're a democratic country um, um, and being trying or uh, trying or actually being a, a fool. Uh, as a democratic state, um, but also sound financial management, which um, it has been has uh, been more been, has appeared to be more and more important in the last few uh, years. Being able to uh, have a, a, bad, a balanced budget, for example, or having a mature uh, taxing system, those are all in, uh, very important. Um, aspects to have in a, in a, in, a, in the in the in the countries in the territories in the in the governance, um, but it's also a safety net from a kingdom perspective, which means that um, um, the kingdom is um, re actually responsible, or actually is the last resort in making in, in assuring that every country uh, by itself can, uh, can, can promote good governance or have uh, some financial management. Okay, and I'm moving to my last slide. Um, yeah, the, the safety net, how does it work in practice? Um, what we have seen in the last few years, especially for Cur from Curacao, a more Curacao perspective, you see that um, financial support is needed, especially due to the, the current crisis, um, but it's against hard conditions. Uh, COCO is uh, one, of, uh, one of those conditions, but also the condition, for example, um, that uh, throughout the, the government of, of Curacao, St. Martin and Aruba, um, uh, this uh, salary deductions for the prime minister or the entire public sector um, uh, had to do some reorganizations and uh, had salary cuts. Um, um, but there are there are more. Um, the, the conditions are uh, of uh, also re, um, reinventing or not reinventing, restructuring the tax uh, uh, system. Uh, tax compliance also an issue. So these are all uh, conditions that are um, uh, actually um, imposed as a, um, uh, as a against the financial support uh, for the, the liquidity support for the for the governments. Um, it also brings the question uh, to um, 
the, self, the, the concept of self-governance and being able to uh, decide the rules by yourself and by the people that you have elected. Um, can you do it by yourself? No smith poor of no smith no poor. That's all, always a, a big issue, and that's also a um, you can consider it a boundary uh, for intervention by the kingdom, uh, uh, but also uh, from the from the the, the the opposite side, which means that you have to uh, admit by yourself as a government that uh, you're not able. Uh, to provide what you can, you can you're not able to provide what's needed to run uh, the country without um, uh, raising your debt too much um, and that brings also the, the question um, can beggars be choosers if you desperately need uh, financial support and you're not able to provide it or you're not able to provide in the basic needs of your of running a country to say it, um, that, uh, as simplified as that, um, can you choose or can you, uh, how much bargaining uh, uh, power do you have at the table for that uh, financial support? Um, and the bottom line, of course, is, or actually the bottom of, 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 of that whole concept is that you're, uh, as a country, you're, um, um, you're compelled actually to uh, make sure that the basic needs are there because you're part of all those uh, treaties, of course. Um, so how about all those um, conditions, hard conditions for financial support and, and the self-governance? How do those um, uh, how do those match actually, or do they match? Um, that's a, a big question that I'm still <laughs> working on, which is uh, again not be answered uh, uh, that lightly because the self-governance is a basic principle that is very valuable, um, but financial um, uh, seeking financial support and um, uh, making sure that you do everything to uh, to, to uh, make sure you get you keep your country running is uh, is also very important. And from another perspective, from another perspective, especially in this crisis, but even before uh, that, uh, the big question is always what's in it for the one providing the financial support? Uh, what's in it for the Netherlands? Uh, we all we see it uh, in the in the relationship between the Netherlands as a provider of an extra financial support uh, towards the Caribbean countries, but we also see it within the European Union. Uh, the question always asks. Uh, in the in, in Dutch Parliament is why do we need to help uh, Spain or Italy or why do we need to build uh, the Greece uh, or why do we need to people of, build people of Greece out what's in it uh, for us and for them and um, those are of course different uh, uh, legal frameworks and different questions because on one hand you have of course the Caribbean countries and on the on their have on their side you have uh, the European Union uh, which are totally different. Uh, for the Dutch Caribbean territories, uh, the the, an the answer um, at first is very simple. What's in it for the Netherlands? Uh, well, not much, except for they have, of course, the legal legal obligation to make sure um, that um, the countries can keep their country running and uh, make sure that human rights are um, um, ensured. So. That's a legal obligation on for them. On the other hand, it's also the case that if we, uh, the, the, you can imagine that the Dutch would say, if we don't help, um, uh, we'll, we have we'll have a, an, an even larger crisis of either people coming over, uh, and we'll have local problems here, or uh, we're being held accountable and responsible for not aiding our former colonies. So that's um, uh, also a. A very large um, uh, aspect of of, of 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 the answer of what's in it for us. Well, it's a legal obligation, and we have to make sure we don't get bigger problems from it. So then, my final slide: um, What's next? What's after this crisis? I just saw um, uh, the first people in Curaçao getting uh, vaccinated, which is a very good uh, good. Uh, good thing uh, i was actually wondering uh, why these people uh, so why the prime minister first uh, um, 
uh, and why a minister first, but I, I sure for sure think that there are um, good reasons uh, for doing so. Uh, um, but, but so uh, what's next? And what's next, especially in the light of uh, Goho and financial support and actually overcoming this crisis and making sure we have a sustainable, uh, we have sustainable legal frameworks and sustainable countries um, uh, and sustainable self-governance, of course, because we, what I don't think what anyone wants is going back uh, to uh, how things have been, uh, but also everybody wants to look forward and to make sure that uh, you have blooming economies, uh, you have uh, tourism coming back up, and and all those revenue streams that you you that you want to make sure that um, you can have uh, the state of welfare that you had uh, uh, that Curacao had in in the in the better times. So um, what's what's next? Well, there are very uh, there are a lot of topics um, to to touch on this point. Uh, I only I, for now I wanted to keep it to four. Um, actually, redefining the public sector, um, I think, for a, a small state, and it has been um, this has been researched by by by, um, by different uh, institutions. In order to have a, a small state um, running um, self-sustaining, actually, you'll need a, a, a certain amount of people, but also um, for for the income and also for the economy to to, to sustain itself. Um, but what's uh, on the on the on the bottom of that is uh, the defining and actually redefining the public uh, the public sector, which are the services that you uh, uh, you need or you want to provide in order to keep your uh, to make sure that your economy is uh, is sustainable. Um, do you need actually do you need twenty percent of your uh, people uh, or uh, yeah do you need 20% of your working people working for the government or for government uh, agencies? Well, the answer is not no or yes. You can see in different countries, uh, non-democratic countries, in which uh, that is a, uh, you have a high number of people being in, 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 in public service in one way or the other. So it's, uh, of, uh, and I think for Curacao and, and, and St. Martin and Curacao and, and Aruba in the same way, in the same manner, um, we'll have to look at what are the services that we provide, what have we done to um, uh, have certain companies, state-owned companies, for example, um, uh, in the private sector, but still being part of the public sector. Uh, Aqualectra, crude oil, uh, companies like those. You have really need a strategic plan uh, to uh, define for yourself uh, what do you want from and with these countries. They're not milk cows for uh, making sure that you make ends meet, um, but they're there and they're uh, private, of course, private state-owned companies for um, the, uh, to, uh, per, to provide goods and services to the people. And you will have to see it from, from that, uh, that perspective. So um, it's a, re a really, uh, important aspect on uh, looking of the future of governance. What are you doing with this? Rotterdam, from uh, uh, I must admit, Rotterdam is also um, uh, in the process of um, re doing this in a certain on a certain level. Rotterdam has um, sold its shares in a large uh, energy company in Eco, and those revenues from those uh, or actually yeah the yeah, the revenues from the, from that uh, sales share share sale. Um, are being used to use and, and to use into new initiatives on uh, uh, sustainable energy and new uh, energy resources, making to in order to do the, the energy transition uh, to meet the Paris uh, goals. Uh, so it happens on a small scale, but also on a large. I see uh, Andy joining the stage, so I, that, I think that's my cue to uh, wind up. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, there's still a lot of things. I'm not going to uh, mention all the uh, points on my slide any, anymore. Um, I think I combined the first and the second, redefining your public uh, also determining new strategy for your state of companies, which is very important. Um, out with the old and in with the new is actually something we can do in the round table. Uh, I have certain, of course, I have ideas on in, uh, 
uh, throw overboard your old ways uh, in governance and, and uh, trying new things. Um, and the last part is uh, seeking strategic partnerships, both within uh, the public and the private sector uh, with neighboring countries, uh, from actually with anyone you think you can have a strategic partnership with maybe meet the goals that uh, you want to meet. Uh, and it's also a very important one is very important aspect I use on a personal level, but I also see on a more uh, professional level, governance, um, dare to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. That's a good one to close with. I mean, if you don't ask, uh, 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 you don't get. Um, I'm, uh, I, I have to thank my former speaker, uh, uh, Didi Wildeman, who was in our last conference. She, she warned me about uh, um, lawyers are very good uh, um, speakers and they, they won't shut up until you tell them to. Um, you definitely proved uh, uh, her right. You have so much to tell. I'm, I'm, I think there are going to be plenty. Oh, um, where did you go? Well, um, that was Aubrey. Uh, um, Aubrey will be back. Uh, there he is. Um, yeah, sorry. And he will be also. No worries. Quick. <laughs> <laughs> you will always be also be back in the in the round table. So everyone who has questions, uh, we will get to them in the round table. I'm gonna. Uh, um, uh, keep the uh, uh, momentum going and and move on to to our Mr. George in in in, in a slight bit, uh, but just one question to you, Albrecht. Um, I'm sharing this knowledge. Uh, um, being between Holland and Curaçao, does it feel different doing this from Holland towards Curaçao, or um, sharing this knowledge while being on Curaçao and working for a, a, a bigger corp, um, uh, law firm here on Curaçao? Um, well. Actually, um, my answer is not going to answer your question directly, but it, uh, <laughs> it, it, it you're always used to this from lawyers. So um, no, what I'm actually uh, what I, um, I I see and do now, uh, it really helps me from uh, to to have to do the work actually I've been doing for the last five years uh, uh, from a from a broader perspective, and so I'm actually filling up my uh, my suitcase my personal and professional suitcase in order to take it here so as much as i of course am allowed and, and, and want to um to use it so uh, keeping my tie and also built from an academic perspective but also in a professional perspective uh our steric bureau is still very involved um uh, with curacao and what's going on in curacao and i think it helped um being in this position and uh, being away for a while, but also getting uh, uh, more information and new insights on, on governance is going to make, make me a better. Uh, yeah. I believe from a distance you always get a, a clearer view than, than when you watch it uh, 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 too long, uh, too up close. So um, I'm going to thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll have uh, uh, some questions about that in in a bit um uh david we'll get to that in in a round table if you don't mind for now i'm gonna ask albrecht to remove himself um off stage and i'm gonna invite uh, uh menno george to to come on stage um we're running slightly late uh, um uh, uh, uh on curacao terms we're, we're running perfectly on time so we'll be fine but there is the the, the gentleman with with the beautiful smile menno uh, yes. welcome Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, how, how, right is <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. how, how is it to be the second speaker and, 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 and have this anticipation building up? Um, no problem at all, actually. I like to be in the second speaker. Then you know how high the bar is, so to speak. Uh, and uh, Albrecht put the, put the bar high, so uh, I have a challenge here. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to give you the stage and I'm going to let you raise your own bar even higher. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sure you, 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 you're good at that. Um, please introduce yourself and, and share your presentation with, uh, uh, with the good people in the chat. And I'll All see right. you uh, back in uh, 15 minutes. Yes. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, I will uh, share my presentation uh, with you all. Um, I uh, also prepared a presentation, uh, The New Era of Governance. I wanted to talk with you all about uh, the future of governance. 
uh, I think it's uh, very important to talk uh, about the future of governance from the point of view of uh, an, an organizational perspective. Uh, I will first off give a brief introduction of myself. Um, I have an education, a former, a rather long educational track record. I started uh, at, at, an, at an LBO level uh, education uh, on QSO, known as uh, the, the VSBO. Um, I, I wasn't a student at first, it was very motivated. But uh, as I got a little bit older, I, I saw a little bit more of what the importance of, of education. Uh, focused on my M, uh, MBO, uh, middle class business studies, but afterwards also did my, uh, my bachelor's. And um, then I finished off in, uh, in, in Holland also, Hogeschool van Utrecht. Uh, I lived a long period in, uh, in Holland, by the way. I um, moved to Holland with nine years old, uh, when I was nine. And I came back to Curaçao the moment I got my, my, um, my diploma, uh, my bachelor's diploma. Uh, in, uh, and it was, uh, I believe, 16, 17 years ago, uh, when, when I was uh, well, uh, 24 years old. And uh, later on, uh, during my, uh, my my period of work in Curaçao, I also obtained my uh, professional uh, MBA. Um, that was by uh, an organization that also provided the MBA on uh, on Curaçao. It's a Dutch a Dutch school, a business school, Nederland, uh, which has a particular uh, MBA course. It's uh, the Action Learning MBA, uh, which is very nice to combine in my set of work as a, a consultant, because you actually learn to solve. Uh, um, 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 practical organizational uh, problems uh, using uh, uh, different skill sets. Uh, that's actually MBA if you're interested in it, look it up. It's very nice uh, to, to, uh, to use. Um, but after, after I um, um, finished my, my bachelor's, I came to Curaçao, as I said. Uh, I started at a small uh, um, governmental uh, foundation, Stichting Innovatie Centrum Curaçao. Over there, fresh, fresh from the school banks, uh, you, you, you're not, you don't have a lot of experience as a consultant. You don't know uh, how you advise an organization uh, when you don't have any organizational experience yourself. But I had some good colleagues over there that showed me the, 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 some skills and tricks. Uh, I, I um, developed myself in implementing uh, systems, quality management systems based on ISO 9001. Uh, and that helped me a lot to get an insight in how organizations uh, operate, how organizations function. Uh, because if you have an international standard that's basically applicable for, for all types of organizations when they want to improve their quality, improve the process quality, um, 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 ISO is a good system. And, and once you know how the system works, you can apply it in every type of organization. Um, after four years working in innovation, Santa Curaçao, I, I uh, wanted to broaden uh, my, my knowledge. And I decided to go to another consulting firm uh, that's named EcoVision. Uh, the intention there was to broaden the, the ISO 9001 knowledge that I have to also the environmental uh, management systems, the ISO 14000. Um, unfortunately, I did not get the chance to uh, um, learn that, but I did a lot of work in the, the sustainable solution side. There was a second uh, organization, there were two sister organizations. And in that organization, I uh, did a lot of um, energy audits of organizations on Curacao within government, but also outside government, looking at ways how they could uh, lower their uh, cost of energy uh, and which type of products you can implement to also uh, gain uh, uh, less energy cost. I did that for approximately a year. And, and uh, yeah, um, if you do that kinds of uh, work, uh, that kind of audits, you get bored uh, pretty quick, at least I did. Uh, and I, I got the opportunity to switch to Deloitte Dutch Caribbean. Uh, I started there as a consultant. I uh, worked my way up all the way to uh, senior manager right now, uh, and uh, I'm responsible for part of the consultant department, uh, mainly strategy and operations, which is my main main area of expertise. But I'm also involved in um, human capital consulting, and in the past I did some uh, work on the technology base uh, also, uh, mainly uh, helping companies in implementing new uh, software systems. I did that both in government, but also private sector. Um, but at the end of the line, I think, um, and definitely if I ask my colleagues, uh, they, they consider me to be a government specialist. Uh, from 2007, 2008, I've been involved in helping governmental organizations with strategy and operations. Uh, in particular, also was involved in the whole, uh, in Dutch they say, the, 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 
the, the date that uh, Pais Corsal was born on 10 10 10. Uh, I had the honor to help uh, write two of the nine business plans for the new ministries, uh, one of them being uh, government planning and um, public services, and the other one being transport, uh, traffic, and urban planning. Uh, was an honor in the sense of uh, I think it's a one it's in a lifetime opportunity that you get the chance to actually help build and construct a new governmental organization. Uh, we did it at 10 and 10. I don't think we'll be doing it again. Uh, and as a young consultant at that time, uh, I got that opportunity and, and it gave me a lot of experience. Um, afterwards, I uh, became a, an implementation manager. I implemented uh, or helped implement four uh, ministries, uh, ministerial business plans. I didn't do that by myself, but of course I did that with um, the ministerial management teams and together with all the civil servants uh, that were placed in, in those ministries. Uh, a lot of work, uh, a lot of uh, ambitions uh, at the time, also a lot of challenges, um, but I think uh, for a certain level we, we managed to do so. Um, but now as a senior manager and, and a lot of experience in government, uh, in Dutch I say, I, I, see the, I, I see the kitchen of the government a lot. I see what, happen, what happens, what's cooking in the kitchen. And I see that the, the, the governmental organization um, hasn't changed sufficiently in the last 10 years. And uh, you see there also on my experience, CV uh, um, that I joined recently, uh, Partido Vichon, uh, political party vision. Uh, I'm one of the list uh, candidates uh, for Vision. Um, I also bring in my area of expertise over there being uh, governmental expertise, um, mainly with a focus on how you can let the organization of the government operate uh, more effectively. Uh, but of course I'm involved in, in a lot of other aspects also uh, from, from our Vision. Um, recently I did a presentation also for Vision, uh, which I used a few of the slides of. Uh, to give a more in detail uh, on how my perspective is on government, uh, and I'll go in more detail about that. Um, I want to talk about the two things actually. Uh, first off, I want to give a snapshot on the current situation, and I'll be using uh, an, 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 a slide that, that we use often in Deloitte. Uh, I call it ingredients of change. It gives the elements that are important uh, if you want to do something with change in an organization. Uh, and of course, I also want to look at conditions for success. What do we have to do uh, um, within the organization of the government if we want to be successful as a government organization? What, which changes do we have to do? Which areas do we have to focus on? And um, um, well, how, how do we go forward on that? But let's start at the, the, the snapshot of the current situation. Um, current situation, I, I, I explain this as the ingredients of change. And if I look at an organization, you have two sides of an organization. You have the right side of the organization and the left side. The right side of the organization is the, the so to speak, the harder side of the organization. And that looks at, at if people are able to actually implement a change in organization. And there are a few elements that have to be in place in order for people to implement that change. One of the aspects that has to be in place is that you have to have a clear vision or when, where you want to go with the organization. We have to have a clear vision on where the governmental organization has to lead us uh, for the upcoming five to 10 years. Uh, we have to have clear goals defined also, and we have to at the same time look if we have sufficient budget. If I look at the current situation, I think there's a lack of a vision. If you ask ministers, if you ask uh, managers, uh, uh, top managers in, in ministries, if you ask the civil servants themselves, or let alone if you have, ask citizens, what are the long, what's the long-term vision of the government? I don't think they have a clear answer. Where do we want to stand as an island in, in, in 10 years, so to speak? Which goals do we want to strive for in the upcoming 10 years? And based on that, you can look if you have sufficient budget, yes or no. We have a lot of budget constraints uh, in, the, in the last few years. Um, we have the safe day controlling if we, if we maintain uh, within the budget standards that we stipulated together with Holland. But you see, once COVID uh, hit in, that we have a lot of problems, and, and Holland has to help us to uh, do all kinds of things, uh, food aid, uh, but also uh, finance all kinds of things in, in, in the private sector in order for companies to, to uh, don't go bankrupt and stuff like that. Um, so you see, we, have, we don't have sufficient budget, uh, despite of also not having a clear vision of where we want to be 
in 10, uh, 15 or 20 years. Once you have that vision, you can also look at what kind of people do you need in your organization and if you have the sufficient numbers of people in your organization to actually uh, work on that vision and implement that vision. Uh, do we have sufficient numbers of capable people uh, and do we have an effective organizational design? Well, in Pen 10, 10, as I explained, we, we wrote nine uh, business plans for the new uh, minister of the organization. Uh, so the, the organizational design is in place, but the intention was that in five years you had to evaluate whether that organizational design is is um, is effective is effective enough and if you have to do certain changes well we're 10 years in in that process and we didn't do the the actual uh, analysis of how effective the organizational design is i can say that we do have sufficient numbers of employees in the organization uh, a lot of people talk about we have to reduce the number of people in the organization. I want to debate on that, but that's uh, that's maybe in, in uh, once I finish my presentation, we can do that. But I'm sure that we don't have the right capabilities in the organization, and I want to I want to focus on that a little bit later on in one of my other sheets. The third aspect that we have to look at to be able to uh, re uh, to realize the change is we have to have effective tools and systems. We have to have the technology to actually help us to implement our strategy. And we have to have a, a sound infrastructure. If you look at that aspect, the government doesn't uh, didn't make enough effort to do so. We don't have sufficient effective tools within our, in the government. We don't apply sufficient technology if we compare ourselves with other islands, with other countries. And the infrastructure is is rather poor. If I have to give an analysis on it uh, on a high level. Those are the, the hard parts, the, the the tangible parts in an organization. If you look at, at it from a change perspective. But you also have to look at this, the soft part, the more cultural part of the organization. That's if you have a vision, if you have the numbers of people, and if you have the effective tools, are people in the organization willing to go, to enter that change? And then we're looking at three other aspects that call belief, belong, and behave, the three Bs. The first off, you have to have belief. If you have a vision, but you don't have anybody in the organization that believes in that vision, it's going to be very difficult to implement it. Uh, you have to have people that to commit to that vision and are willing to carry it out and are willing to 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 go for the goals that we stipulated um, and 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 are willing to do that within the the budget we stipulated. Um, if you look in practice, I think a lot of people didn't believe in the in the vision, believed in the business plans that were drafted uh, uh, amongst ten ten ten. Uh, partially, that's also being influenced politically in the sense of. You had a coalition before 10, 10, 10 that worked on the, the whole organizational structure, the vision, et cetera. But afterward, the, 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 the coalition parties came, came in the opposition, uh, the opposition parties became coalition. They actually became the government and they had to execute on a strategy that, that other parties developed. And I think there uh, you got a lot of problems with the belief within the organization, a lot of civil servants, a lot of managers, but also a lot of ministers that didn't believe in the vision, didn't believe in the goals that were stipulated. And if, if leadership isn't in, then it's very difficult to, to motivate people to go uh, the, the extra mile. The second part is belonging. Once you, once you have, have, have the organizational design, once you have the people in place, they also have to belong. They have to feel uh, connected to the organization that they're positioned in. Uh, we had 4,000, a little bit over 4,000 civil servants that were positioned in a new governmental organization. Some came from the Netherlands Antillen, some came from uh, Island Gebied Curaçao, but they all got a position, and that's one of the things that was stipulated by the, the old government at that time. Everybody, there was a stool, there was a chair for everybody in a new organization. Um, everybody had a place, but not everybody felt that they belonged in the organization. Uh, there was a process after the, 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 the positioning of people that they um, that they could object. Uh, in total, I believe 30% of the 4,000 people that were positioned in a new situation, in a new position in organization, uh, objected to their uh, their new position, their new function. So that gives an indication of how how people belong in organization. And lastly, once you have the effective tools, effective systems in place, you also want to look at how people behave in organization. Uh, do they share a common understanding of how things are done in the organization? And there also was a big lack in the organization. Once you have a new organization in place, you don't have sufficient leadership in place that, that believes in that vision. 
it's very difficult to convince the people to behave in certain manners. And then one of the biggest problems I, I, we encountered at that time is you had, a, uh, I think, a little over a thousand people that were from uh, the, the Dutch Antilles government that have a whole different culture, a whole different way of working compared to the, the civil servants from um, the, the, the island of Curaçao, which clashed at certain points. They had different systems, they had different technology, um, different ways of being led by their managers. Uh, and all those things made that not everybody behaved the same way, which also impact, impacted the implementation of the new governmental structure negatively. At the end of the line, and it's something you see beneath, a formal and informal leadership that is capable of driving and executing of the strategy. I think at that time we had a lack of formal and informal leaders that were capable to driving the change actually going forward with a new organizational structure. Um, and that, that had a big impact on how it was implemented, but it also has a big, big impact on how the, the governmental organization uh, functions uh, right now, uh, in the sense of um, um, how effective it is, uh, how we rate um, um, services provided by the government, et cetera, et cetera. Looking forward, um, I also want to look at which elements do we need to give extra attention. And uh, the conditions of success, I think we have to put, uh, put some attention on, on four elements. Uh, I think we have to look at the, the balance of public finances. How do we tend with our public finances, limited funds that we have? Uh, I have a, a good metaphor to, to explain something a little bit more detailed on that. I cannot go in depth, but uh, I will touch something about public finances. The second one is we have to implement modern human resource management um, tools and, and, and instruments, something we didn't do in the last 10 years, uh, with, which has a big impact on how the governmental organization uh, functions right now. The third part is uh, effect, efficient and effective processes, uh, also for uh, policy development. And we have to look for a certain level of transparency within the organization. People, companies uh, established in Curaçao have, have a right to have a transparent uh, governmental organization, have a right to the government being transparent in what they're doing, what they're doing with our funds, where they spend our funds, and what the, the added value is for our island. And lastly, technology, also very important once you, once you want to uh, um, gain an, an extra edge as an organization, but also as a country, you have to implement new technology in order to be better, if more efficient, more effective, and, and, and also more customer focused. Those are the conditions. I'm gonna go briefly in, in each one separately, highlighting some aspects, and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to a small recap. Um, first off, a balance of public finance. And I'm, I'm using a metaphor over here um, that recently one of my, my colleagues in Vichon also used in a presentation. Um, if you look at um, um, finance in general, I look at it and, and I explain it from the point of view of a family. Within a family, you have a father, a mother, and some kids. And in, in, this, in this family, the father works and the mother is at home taking care of the kids. The father um, works, gets salary, and gets uh, benefits. And um, based on that, he can, he can do several things with, with his money. Uh, also in house, of course, you have the mother that also has influence on how we spend our money. Uh, do, uh, how many do we have to pay uh, on mortgage? How do we, many uh, do we have to pay on, on loans? Uh, how many do we have to pay on, on groceries and stuff like that? But then you also have the kids in the house that are they're pretty demanding and also want their things. The one wants a bike, the other one wants a new, new iPhone, all kinds of things that, that our kids want. And, and the father bringing in the money and the mother also looking at it, have to look at how they deal with that. But the mortgage and the loans we have, we have that at the bank. So we're also responsible to pay our bills. We're also responsible to pay our mortgage to the bank. And if we don't do that, we have an account manager or in some cases a controller that also is in contact with father, mother, or the family and looks at uh, what do we have to do to make sure that every month the, month the, 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 the payment comes in. We get a salary and we have to pay all kinds of things. And the controller and the account manager of the bank looks at where do we spend our money and do we spend it effectively, yes or no, and how can we do that more effective? That's, that's a perspective from a family, and I, I, wanna, I wanna elaborate on it a little bit more in the sense of, of government. If you look at the government right now, or government organization, I say the father is the government in this case, and the mother is, is parliament. They have to work together. The government is the one that manages all funds, all, all, all 
funds that come in, and Parliament has to check if the government uses those funds effectively, yes or no. The, the Parliament has to, has to be the, 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 the controller within the House that looks at, hey, government, we, we, we have a budget, we have money coming in, and are we spending that money effectively, yes or no? And the children in the House are the citizens. At the end of the day, we're, we're spending all that money so our children have the, the best education, uh, can, can at a certain point of time stand on their own feet, but children are demanding, they want all kinds of things. What you see right now in government is that we, we, we uh, tell our citizens that we can, can do all kinds of stuff for them. We can increase minimum wages, we can, we can, we can um, uh, legalize all kinds of houses, stuff like that. That's things that, are, that the government or future governments are, are selling to, to citizens, but we have to look at if it's effectively possible, yes or no. Because at the end of the line, we have to have the funds in place to do so. Our bank uh, as an island is for now the kingdom government. The kingdom, especially where we're at right now with COVID, the, king, the, the government of the kingdom decides whether we can get uh, loans for certain, for, to, 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 to uh, solve certain problems that our island is in right now. And uh, they have strict um, standards in which situation our government can loan money from the government of the kingdom in order to um, yeah, get e economic development, uh, uh, do social development, etc., etc. And in the case of the government, the kingdom government, they have the CFT right now. But in the near future, we have the coho that acts as a controller, acts as an account manager, and looks at it, all money that the kingdom government gives our government. Uh, um, is actually spent in the right manner. Uh, this is the way also I think we have to uh, explain the whole situation that we're in to our citizens because it's important for them to know what the actual role is of COHO. We have a lot of discussions locally on, on what the role is and we're, in my opinion it's very simple. Uh, they're not going to sit on the chair of the government, the local government. It's not the way it works. When in the family sense, once, once the father and the mother and the, the family have a mortgage and they go to the bank and they get a loan, the controller, the account manager, is not going to sit on the chair of, of the family. He or she is checking if people are spending their money effectively and if because they want to make sure that they get their money back. They want to make sure that they, they get their loan back. And that's the same thing in the sense of safety and co. in this case. We loan money from the kingdom government and the co. is made there to ensure that we actually make the right decisions, uh, fund the right projects, etc in order for us in the long term to pay our loans back to the kingdom government. That's basically how, how I see public finance right now. Once again, I can go in more in depth, uh, but there's not sufficient time to do so. Um, but maybe later on we can also talk about flexibilization of uh, our tax laws, et cetera, et cetera, because there are several other aspects that are very important if you look at public finance from a governance perspective. But going forward, um, we also have to focus on modern HRM. Modern HRM, uh, we have all kinds of instruments that we can implement that have to do with HRM. I want to focus on only one in this presentation because it's one that's very important and it's one that's very actual or very current right now. And it has to do with the type of positions, the type of functions we need in an organization uh, that's called the government. Um, if you look at the, the, the matrix that I show uh, in the presentation, on uh, the horizontal level, you see a low or a high impact on the primary process. So you have certain positions that have a, have a low impact on the primary process, or maybe back office positions, but you have also uh, um, positions and functions in organization that have a high impact on the core business. They're actually the ones that are in, in the front line or maybe actually also in contact with citizens or companies on the island. At the other end, you have um, replace, replaceability of positions in the organization. Some positions are uh, difficult to replace and some uh, positions are very easy to replace. You have high uh, replaceability and low replaceability. Based on this matrix, we have to rethink how we want to do the organizational design of the government. If you look at the government right now, they all see these positions as one. In Dutch said, we have one fancy book for the whole island. And in that fancy book, you have all positions, all functions of the government, and they all fall in the same salary and benefits uh, um, um, structure. We think, you, or I think, you have to rethink that whole process. If you look at the lower positions, those are positions within the government that are pretty, pretty nicely paid, so to speak. 
uh, preferably you would like to have a position like this within the government instead of in the private sector. Administrative support functions and core functions are better paid within the government and are lesser paid in the private sector. If you look at the, the, the upper functions, the specialistic position and the critical position, that's, net, that's, that's the opposite. If you're in a critical or a specialistic position, you're, you, you, you're better to work in, in, in the private sector because you'll probably get more paid in the private sector compared to in, within government. And there, I think, lies the big problem of the organization of the government, because the government also needs specialistic and critical positions. But the, the, the salary structure and the benefit structure of a government isn't attractively enough for specialistic and critical uh, people in specialistic and critical positions to remain within the government. Let me give some examples of, of those positions. If you look at the lower aspect, the more administrative and support functions, you're looking at HR officers, finance officers, of people that do, once again, back office work in a more supportive kind of, kind of a role. Um, if you look at these positions, you, I, you would prefer to be an HR officer within the government because you would get relatively high salary compared with the same position outside of the government. If you look at semi-government, overheads and vase, it's incredible. If you're an HR officer in overnight SMV, you're, you're the best paid person ever. There are some HR managers, I don't know if you guys know, but there are HR managers within overnight SMV that, that get a salary that's higher as a, as a prime minister right now, to give an example. If you look at the right side, you have more, the positions that more uh, front desk uh, kind of positions of permit employees, employees that actually deal with people and, 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 um, issue permits. Um, once again, these are people that are relatively quickly to train. So the replaceability is rather high. You can you can replace them pretty quickly, um, but they function in a core position. They, in the primary process, they play an important role. I want to go look at the, up, the, the upper part of the, the, the matrix. Uh, if you look at a specialistic position, I gave two examples of a cybersecurity uh, officer or a data analyst. If you look, for example, at uh, our Central Bureau of Statistics, there you have data analysts. But you have certain other organizations within the government that also need their data analysts. We do a, we lack data analysts within the organization. Why is that? It's very simple. If you look at our um, financial sector, if you look at um, the consultancy and, and, and services sector, if you look at other sectors with, in the private sector, a data analyst, they're pretty scarce. You don't get them a lot. If I look at Deloitte, uh, the organization I work for, it's very difficult to get data analysts. So we have to get them abroad. Once you get them abroad, you have to pay them a lot of money because if not, they are not willing to come to our island. So once again, these types of positions are very difficult for the government to uh, to uh, attract. Same comes with cybersecurity. I prefer to be a cybersecurity officer within a bank compared to the government. I get triple pay maybe in a bank compared to cybersecurity within the government. But that does not mean that cybersecurity isn't important for the government. For example, recently the government uh, developed uh, a website for now, uh, which uh, contains a lot of valuable information on companies, on revenues, on, on, on salaries, et cetera, et cetera. How secure are those uh, um, websites that the government develops? Without cybersecurity in-house, it's very difficult to evaluate whether um, whether the, the government manages that effectively, yes or no. I'm see, I, I reached a three uh, three minute mark already, so I'll, I'll try to wrap it up, um, Andrew. Uh, another critical function: lawmakers, aviation special inspectors, inspectors, lawmakers, positions that are, that that um, that you have to do uh, extensive education for, but also are available in the private sector. Um, same counts for specialistic functions. If you have those types of functions, I'd rather be a pilot in the private sector than I would be an aviation inspector within the organization of the government because simply I'm better paid. That, that means that the government has to lower quality of work in order to gain people to do that. You don't get an aviation inspector to, to meet the level of a pilot because he, he, a pilot um, um, it gets triple, quadruple the salary of an aviation inspector within the government. So you have to, um, that, that goes, um, you have to get problems with, with quality in the sense of uh, services in that case. Let me go briefly to my last two slides, um, effective and uh, effective and effectiveness, and also technology. I think they're, they're, they're glued together. 
the government has to be more transparent in policy making. The government makes policy, that's the, one of their main tasks. But what you see right now is that the private sector hardly is involved in that process. The, part, the private sector is also hardly informed about um, the, the output of policy making. We don't simply don't see certain policies that are made by government, which makes it very difficult for the private sector to maybe help in executing them. That's one thing I think the, the, the government can learn of and be more transparent and uh, sharing policies, new policies with, with uh, the private sector. Data drivenness, uh, I also talked about it in briefly. Uh, the government has a lot of data within the several organizations that they have. They have several registers, so to speak, but there is a lack of a connection within, between those registers, which makes it very difficult to, to make data-driven decisions. Uh, we have a, a tax organization that's not connected with uh, our Chamber of Commerce, which is not connected with the organization for, um, that has, a, has, a, has an administrative system for people. It's not connected with uh, the SVB that does uh, that has a register for uh, uh, salaries. If you don't have the connection with, between those organizations or between those systems, it's very difficult to do uh, data-driven decision making. Uh, we have to eliminate red tape and organization of the government, and we're talking about that for over 10 years right now. I think it's very simple. Start automating and digitalization within the organization of the government, actually implement new systems, systems that are bought already by the government, implement them, and then you will actually eliminate red tape for 90%, if not more, but you will also eliminate corruption and nepotism within an organization once you have automated and digitalized processes. Uh, that's my last point also, minimize corruption and nepotism. Once you get more effectiveness and efficiency, once you implement more technology within an organization, those elements will also be uh, combated right away, less corruption and less nepotism within organization. People, I want to leave it at that. Um, I had the Q&As right here, but I think uh, Andrew will take over for uh, the round the table for it, uh, concerning uh, questions and answers. Thank you for your attention and uh, hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry that they have put you uh, um, in a short spot because I can tell you had a lot more to tell. I wrote down quite some quite some questions, so I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go uh, there in a bit. Um, I want to thank all the participants uh, um, um, for being there. Um, to be sure, let me first share uh, this one with the people in case you want to connect with Menno uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, um, go ahead; you can find him there. Um, uh, but it's something very important before I'm going to ask Albrecht to the table. I want to have this moment alone alone with you because you, you mentioned something very important. How do you go from intention to implementation? Uh, indeed, uh, I also know there, there are many programs being developed uh, for the government, uh, but how do you get those people and not so much the uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, the people that are working inside the ministries to use that software? Uh, because I, I've, I have the feeling and... Uh, um, Please uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, how do you get them to actually use that software? Because I feel that's where it gets stuck. Uh, after. Well, there's a few things. There, there are a few laws that you actually have to change. For example, uh, a lot of people in Curacao know that for certain permit applications, you have to have the stamp, the old stamp that you have to go to a Chinese uh, place to get a stamp of five or ten guilders and that, they, that they put in the permit. That's old-fashioned old work. But there is a simple law that, that, that we are apparently aren't willing to change. Once we change that, then you can fully go dig digitalized. Uh, in the past, I, I uh, helped the organization of Mayo, uh, Ministry of Economic Development, to digitalize a few processes for uh, foreign investors to get uh, permits. Uh, one of the things you have over there is that you have, for example, a sector director or uh, a, a secretary general that says, I want to put my, my, my signature with a, with a pen on that, in, on that paper as where you can digitalize also the signature. So that's also people aren't willing to do the change. Well, if you don't have leadership willing to do the change, I cannot ask my employees to do the change also. I think implementing new technology has to be, uh, there has to be a long-term strategy behind it, a vision behind it, and you have to do it top down. In a certain point of time, once you do a, a, a permit application and you digitalize it, automate it, once you take out the, the, the analog or the hard copy one, there's only one way to do it. And that's something we have to do in organization of the government also. There has to be somebody that, that, that takes the final decision as of tomorrow, 
we work within the system and we don't do it uh, um, hard copy anymore. The hard copy one, we, 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 we don't look at it anymore. And then that will stop. But as long as you per permit the organization to work also hard copy style, you won't implement the digital style of work. Uh, we have uh, many things to discuss over there, but I'm going to ask, uh, uh, um, of course, uh, um, Aurich to come on stage. Aurich, please come back on stage. And Janne to, to come back on stage. Um, I fully agree with what you just said. Uh, um, just to give you an example, as Innovation C, we are a foundation. And this is also a, a, a little bit to, uh, um, uh, uh, to David. Um, we um, are being built in a, in a blockchain matter. So we try uh, uh, to, to digitize everything and indeed not, not needing hard copies, but you're still working with an old fashioned system. Um, we are working since September to open a bank account. And um, I mean, I, I can start crying straight up right now here because how much drama that's taking. Um, but yeah, uh, um, uh, David, I hope your answer was, uh, 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 your, your question was answered by, by Aubrich, was an awesome answer there. Didn't know that, so I, I would love to know more about that in a bit as well. And of course, Luke, our own uh, uh, blockchain specialist, also answered. We're working uh, very hard uh, to, to, to bring uh, the blockchain in, in into the, the atmosphere, uh, uh, in the regular atmosphere over here, because as I believe as well that the blockchain is, is one of the most uh, perfect ways of governance for the for the future. Now, how what do you two think about that? To have the blockchain as a governance system. Well, actually, if I may add to um, uh, going from from hard copy to digital to the digitalization, I can give a perfect example, which I'm actually in the middle of it right now. Um, in Curacao, you guys have elections in a few weeks. Um, here in the Netherlands, we also have local, we have national elections for the national parliament, for the Tweede Kamer. Um, and we know since, well, more than a year that we'll be having elections in a few weeks. Um, we know more, for more than a year that um, COVID is not going away for uh, for a while and, and, and our vaccination strategy is not fast enough to, to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to make it prior to the elections. So th those are all things that we know. Um, here in, in, in the Netherlands, you use your, uh, I don't know if you guys uh, know the concept, you know, use DigiDay, which is a digital platform to arrange your um, uh, your, your public matters uh, and uh, apply for uh, different uh, public services and also uh, um, use your DigiDay Digi to sign your, um, I think it's your, sign your tax, uh, tax returns or, or some formalities like that. Anyway, in Rotterdam, we're organizing, we're part of, of course, the whole, uh, every uh, city has to organize uh, the, the, the elections. And um, we're not using any digital applications, but we're using, um, uh, everybody gets a, a pencil, which they can throw away. And for the people who are over 70, uh, they can return their um, uh, uh, votes, actually, just like in the United States, per, mail so they're using two envelopes one envelope into the other through mail so we have an entire digital infrastructure in which we communicate with the government which we can identify ourselves um my dg days is is actually um linked with my uh, phone i can i had to make a picture of my uh, passport uh, and uh, take a facial picture in order for the government to uh, to ad identify me as a person so we can do all that kind of stuff but uh, elections, uh, we're, in, we're, we're just afraid of doing it. And that's which brings me to my point. Uh, that, that's why I'm using this example. Um, we have the infrastructure, it's all there, it's in place. Maybe we, need, we needed a few tweaks uh, to do it, but uh, we're afraid of doing it, which is what we call in Dutch, koud watervrees. I know what you need. What you need is a Rianne Cecilia as a project manager that can uh, get this stuff streamlined. <laughs> Rianne, welcome in the screen. Uh, I, we haven't heard you yet. Uh, um, how was it for you uh, um, seeing the presentations in the background? Oh, uh, great. I think governance for me, and I think governance, you can look at governance from different perspectives. Because even within project management, you have the concept of governance and how you're going to uh, look at it. I do think that some sensitive, um, I think typically this discussion around governance and uh, your, your PhD topic is being, I would say it's quite 
sensitive sometimes if you have these discussions with people in person. Um, so it is great that we have received some, I think, key information, uh, necessary information that will inform uh, people. So, and I definitely think that we should look at how can we share this even beyond our main channels, basically, that we already do or promote it even more. Because I do think there's valuable information that has been shared throughout this, uh, throughout this session that more people should be aware about. Um, and there are some things that I've uh, learned about as, uh, as well. And, and maybe just to add, uh, Mano, I'm all for uh, digitalization technology, of course, but hey, I am, again, now, biased. Well, recently, uh, recently, one of the also again, Vision colleagues uh, did a presentation on the digitalization. Uh, this Saturday, he's uh, repeating it in Dutch. And he looked at the Estonia situation where they do exactly the opposite. Every uh, process, every permit, every service that the government provides to citizens is digitalized and they make a sound decision on which ones you can do physically. And we do the opposite. We do everything physically. I have to go pay my taxes physically. I have to go pay my motorrijtuigenbelasting physically. And, and, and a big problem in Curacao is, is um, productivity. I'm a consultant, so my, my boss looks at the hours that I provide for my clients. Well, if I have to stand in line an hour and a half to pay my, my taxes, if I have to stand an hour and a half in line to pay my uh, insurance, also, all those elements are in productivity that, that, that we in Curacao, we, we don't mind that. But if we want to be productive, we have to be more digital savvy so, so we can actually do those things online and do them wherever we sit. And that, that makes us far more effectively, far more productive at the end of the line, uh, which also is a benefit of the government. But a lot of times I think the government uh, doesn't see their actual role in facilitating those developments. And instead of see, sees it like, you know, it's a, it's a burden, they have to invest. It's, it's difficult, we have to convince uh, civil servants to work digital. No, we have to invest in that because at the end of the line, you're there to provide a service. And if that service nowadays is, gone, is, is being conducted digitally, we have to provide it. I just bought a car uh, um, right after the lockdown and with all the changes that, that we had, uh, um, I heard so many things are digitalized. You don't have to go there. You don't have to go there. And I was so surprised that I still had to go get a pink slip at the SUV uh, um, to bring that pink slip to the curling local. Uh, and I was like, okay, this, this is one of the first things that should change because first it reduces my time on the street. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, pumping fumes in, in, into the air. Um, you don't need two people giving uh, handling the same form. It can all be digitalized. So that, that's something that we're gonna um, that, that we hopefully can uh, work on. That's one thing that, that we as innovation C stands for. But at the end of the line, sorry that I interrupted, Andrew. We have to look at what the, what, what we actually want to do. We're paying taxes right now uh, for um, for for our cars that at the end of the day have to go in our roads. Uh, and secondly, we have to pay taxes and also pay insurance for our car in order for police to see actually that we, we did so and that we were on the street legally, so to speak. The police department doesn't have a system, so if they drive behind you, they cannot see if you paid your taxes or they cannot see if you paid your insurance, yes or no. So that's one element of the equation that, up, that doesn't function. The second one is... And that's something, uh, once again, I think is, is a good alternative. If you, if you put the, the, um, the motor voertuigenbelast and the taxes on, on, on vehicles in, for example, uh, in gasoline, you eliminate everything. And then you have a system in which the, the, the guy that drives around the whole day pays a lot of more taxes compared to the, the mother that has to bring her kids to, to, to school once or twice a week that doesn't have a lot of money. Basic things that we have to look at, and we, that's the problem in, in the government also. We look at problems in a silo, but we don't look at the bigger picture and, and look how to s solve more problems at once at a time. I, I love that idea. I've never heard of that one, but I, I love that idea. I have a, a question for, for, for Albrecht about uh, um, self. You talked about self governance, uh, um, but if we as an island um, have an obligation to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but the Kingdom of the Netherlands has a responsibility to the EU, uh, uh, EU uh, European uh, uh, Union. How does that work um, as an island? Do we do we have to take that in consideration? Or in our self-governance? Um, actually, no. I think um, 
uh, as a matter of fact, it only brings more benefits for uh, uh, the, 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 the overseas territories as being part of the European Union because you have the European citizenship, uh, which also applies to people from Curacao and uh, Martin, of course, uh, for having the Dutch passport. Um, so it doesn't, uh, from uh, from that perspective, it doesn't bring any burden uh, in its affairs. Uh, so in the affairs of the, the, the Dutch government, in its affairs uh, with the Curacao Aruba and Martin, um, uh, there is not much that they have to take into consideration themselves, only that the Dutch uh, in, in, in providing, or actually in being the bank of Curacao, uh, as Manuel explained it, um, it has to make sure that uh, it doesn't exceed its budget uh, with, with the European within the European Union. But um, the landing capacity uh, is very high, so uh, they will never reach uh, reach that level. So, uh, this, uh, um, uh, no, it only bring it has it only brings benefits and almost no uh, uh, no burden. Okay. And, and I have a, a, something that, that came in both your presentation, but in a, di in a little bit different. Um, how can we build our own financial support? Um, I would love to hear your take on, on a little bit of the, the Denmark model, how they built um, uh, with their Curo companies and, and, and things like that. Uh, would that be possible for Curacao? Uh, um, that, that's a question to, to, to both of you um, in, in our governance system. Um, we have these uh, um, uh, overhead envies. Uh, can we use that uh, um, for our own uh, um, financial support without it? Uh, um, I don't remember which one of you said it, that we just use their profits to, to fill our uh, deficits. Yeah. Um, if I may, uh, Menno, um, so, yeah, I, I use the term milk cow because um, in practice, we have been something that um, um, the government State-owned companies, government-owned companies, if they um, and actually make profit, even if they don't, or if they almost don't, um, they're uh, they are being compelled, actually, mandatory, uh, mandatory, in a mandatory manner, to uh, provide dividends to the country of course, which is, of course, the right thing to do because um, uh, the country of Curacao is the sole. Uh, um, uh, but instead of um, being buff uh, creating buffers, we're actually reinvesting um, those profits into the company itself. Um, it might be the, 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 the same thing that um, uh, mentioned several times to the Kyrgyzstan government. Hey, there's money. You have money on the street. Go get it from your state owned um, so that's where the term uh, milk out comes from. From my perspective, that's um, uh, not a development um, you would like to see. And we've seen reports from uh, institutions like IMF or World Bank um, stating that um, have, they had to, have, need to formulate a vision on the ones which are paid those companies. And one of the main, um, um, main pillar visions should be that uh, the services they provide and, uh, is not only to create uh, uh, more value uh, for itself, but also give it back to the country, but not in the form of paying uh, of, of, of dividend distribution back to fill gaps in the uh, national budget. Awesome. Uh, uh, Menno, can you please share, share your take for us for... Uh, we, I have to say we have to keep it uh, short because we're, we're almost running out of time and I have so many more questions. Uh, um, but uh, Menno, please please give yours uh, um, and then... Your mic is muted. Your mouth moves very yeah. beautiful, but I couldn't hear you. Once again, if we, if we talk about uh, specifically on, on uh, governmental envies, um, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that our organizations don't look at effectively what their role is within our um, within our country. Uh, if you look at an Aquilectra, if in the, in the past you looked at the UTS, I think at the end of the day, these organizations have to look at how can I provide my services 
to a lower cost as possible to citizens and companies within the organization. Uh, sorry, within the island. If you have a collector, if you have a, a, a telecom provider that, um, for example, uh, provides a telecom and Wi-Fi uh, freely to schools, if possible, what would be the effect of that uh, long term? If you have an organization that provides uh, um, uh, um, electricity and water to businesses that have to be competitive, not only locally, but internationally, what would be the effect of that for our economy? But if they if they look at their their own position as a, a monopoly organization and say no, we have to make profit and uh, we're going to sell it at a at, at the high cost as possible, then they can provide some 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 funds for the government uh, as as a shareholder. But at the end of the day, you have a lot of companies that cannot compete internationally because simply we have very expensive water, very expensive electricity on the island, and we have to look at it on a macro level. And I think. Um, uh, yeah, that's a, a new shift that we have to make still. Yeah. Uh, um, there, there are so many questions and so many things. Uh, um, we, we need to round up may, a little bit. Andrew, if uh, I may add, before you wrap up, so I'm sorry. This, yeah. uh, this is something also, this transition you have to make. It, it has to come from the inside. I mean, it, 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 it has to go from the, uh, the, the, the person working at the front desk until the, the CEO. Um, and, of course, their, their, their salaries. You can if you work in the what I call semi-public sector, you have to make sure that you're not going to you're not going to be rich. If you want to be rich, go work in the private sector. So that's also one aspect that uh, has to be uh, you need to take into consideration and to put, have uh, the, the reevaluating your your vision on these overheads. Yeah. I love it. I mean, uh, uh, this is just what I was typing. I'm going to share the link here. We are creating a pure neuros uh, uh, talent pool with Innovation C. Uh, um, these digital, mini digital conferences that we organize, the, the talks that we have with other people are just a part of it uh, uh, to help us uh, uh, improve our mindset to become more uh, um, uh, servicial, uh, more service minded, um, get more uh, um, uh, uh, women in tech, get more uh, 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 males in in. Uh, um, in, in law, uh, um, improve our way of thinking, uh, personal development, it's all very important. And I mean, um, I, I want to applaud you both. I mean, uh, uh, Aubrey, uh, uh, um, I mean, for you from a Dutch Marine uh, uh, to become uh, uh, a financial, uh, 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 sorry, financial, not uh, uh, a, a law. Uh, um, legal uh, counsel. Yes, thank you. A, a legal counsel. <laughs> I mean, from, from, from the adventurous job to, to, to the boring job but doing it so well um uh, i mean i applaud you i i truly admire you i believe you you are absolutely an example one of our uh, a true talents on Kyrshaw. so uh, i will definitely share your your thesis um on our facebook and menno um uh, i mean i already admired you from from afar we, we had never met but i knew some <laughs> things from from in the background um but now uh, i'm seeing your story uh, um, coming from an lbo vsbo to where you are now um it also shows your perseverance your your determination um your willpower and it shows that everything is possible if you put your mind to it um and with that um i mean i'm getting goosebumps just to think of it we as innovation c are working on on, on the future plans of this uh, um you in rotterdam you with fishong and, and with deloitte um we as innovation c hope to work with you many more uh, uh with many more projects and of course uh, uh Rihanna, um, as uh, one of our uh, uh, use the diaspora, uh, 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 one of our children of diaspora, thank you for always being there uh, with me, for me. Um, uh, thank you for showing up. Um, for everyone, please register uh, in our talent pool. If you have any questions, um, send us an email. Um, you can find us on our website, innovationcure.com. And of course, uh, you know how to find these two gentlemen. Any closing words uh, um, from uh, Menno and Aubrey? Well, uh, maybe if I go first, Aubrey, I, I uh, share with you guys a presentation from Vision. Once again, I didn't do it for, for getting in votes, but it, it actually gives a good insight in where we stand or what we did do in the last 10 years and where we stand right now. If you're more interested to get more detail behind the presentation I gave today, look at it and, and do what you want to do with it. It's also available in Papimento. I, I uploaded the, the Dutch one. Uh, but once again, it's, it's just to give you an insight in where do we stand right now with the government and what do we do in the last 10 years? Thank you for uh, your, uh, the time you gave me uh, for this uh, 
on this podium and uh, well in the near future uh, maybe you can uh, do it again yes for sure Alvig. yeah th thank you andrew uh, and also Mano, um your inspiring words uh, rihanna thank you for uh, your part in this and uh, yes uh, it's it's been an honor um and even to be invited and to be able to uh, to use more time than i was actually granted <laughs> <laughs> so i uh, and and of course uh, i would love to do this again uh, in this or or any other way uh, if i can contribute from this side of the ocean uh in in, in any way any form uh, you're more than uh, more than welcome and yes of course um um uh, if you have any questions on the topics that I uh, I touched today, or uh, for my job actually, or actually with the things that we have uh, encountered here in Rotterdam, uh, feel free to to to, to reach out. Viviana, any famous last words from you? No, I just want to say thank you for your presentations. And actually, Andy, that's more a suggestion for us is that because um, this session could have taken longer, and then we could have gone more in depth in questions, and maybe I would have love to to see whether we can organize a more discussion basically the presentations have been done but maybe a, a hosted discussion session basically but let's look into that separately <laughs> yeah uh, the, absolutely every yeah. time it, it, it's fun uh, and there's so many different uh, aspects that we get so we definitely gonna uh, be in touch with you to have a, a different conversation uh, and and more in depth uh, Lady, gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a great evening. Uh, thank you to all the people in the chat uh, participating. Thank you also for being part of us. You can find us on, on all the socials right there in the link. Um, after I end this event, it's imme almost immediately going to go in a replay so you can rewatch yourself. And later we'll post it also um, uh, on our YouTube channel. Well, have a good afternoon and peace out. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.